choir has been working for months and months on this song, Carol of the Bells. And as you hear the Carol of the Bells, we're using three octaves of bells, and you'll hear the melody go all the way through all the bells. You'll hear some different sounds from the bells. Listen to it. Christmas Day Their old familiar carols play And mild and sweet their songs repeat A peace on earth, goodwill to men And the bells are ringing Singing. Peace on earth. 
Hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. But the bells are ringing peace on earth. like a choir they're singing. Peace on earth. Does anybody? Bible to Galatians chapter 4, please, this morning. Galatians chapter 4. Appreciate so much the good music today. Brother Don, thank you for your handbell playing for us. That was a blessing. And uh, John and uh, Morgan, what a great song. And Lisa on the offertory, that was just tremendous, tremendous. Thank you for all of that. And it's all to prepare our hearts for the next few moments. The most important part of the service today will be the next maybe 30 minutes or less. We'll see. And, uh, but I hope our hearts are ready to hear this morning what God has for us. If we don't hear from God today, then we've wasted our time. We've gotten out of our beds and gotten our coffee and gotten up and come to church, and we've done so for naught if God doesn't speak to us this morning. So I pray, as I preach, I pray God would let you listen and ask God this, God, today speak to me. Speak to me today. And if you do that, I think God would do so. Galatians chapter 4, go ahead and stand to your feet. I'm going to get right into the scripture this morning. Galatians chapter 4, you'll not hear in these next few words I'm going to read, you'll not hear anything about Mary or Joseph, you'll not hear anything about the wise men, the shepherds, there's no gold, frankincense or myrrh are going to be talked about during the text uh, today in Galatians 4, but I can guarantee you this, Galatians 4 is as much a, 
is as much a Christmas scripture as Luke chapter 2 is. And you'll see it in just a moment. Look in Galatians chapter 4, verse 4 and verse number 5. Listen carefully, please. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that he, we might receive the adoption of sons. The first phrase in verse 4 means, when the fullness of time was come. In other words, at the exact time that God said all this happened. God sent forth His Son. Thank you. God sent forth His Son. And the end of verse 5 says, so we might receive the adoption of sons. I want to preach on this thought this morning. God sent forth His Son. Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord, for sending forth Your Son that we might be adopted into the family of God. We might be able to be a son or a daughter of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords because of Christmas. And thank you, Lord, for what this time of year means. Thank you for this special uh, service this morning. Thank you for all the good music. And most importantly this morning, we thank you for your word. I pray your word would speak to us and draw us today. And I pray especially today in a couple of moments as we have our invitation that somebody who the Lord needs to be saved might trust Christ this morning. I pray also for that one who is saved and yet their life is away from the Lord. I pray they might get right with God today. But whatever it is, we thank you for sending forth your Son. I pray in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Have a seat, please. There's a lot of very profound things about the birth of Jesus Christ. Every birth mentioned from the birth of Cain in the book of Genesis on to you and our birth, everybody that's ever been born, uh, the birth of Christ is the, mo the most momentous birth to ever happen. The birth of Christ changed history. The, 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 on the calendar even, there is such and such a year B.C. before Christ. And then there's everything that happened after that. There's B.C. and there's A.D. It, it, the birth of our, of our Savior, it changed how we keep time. Interesting. You ever noticed it before? I don't know if you have, but after we read about the birth of Christ, we don't hear about, we don't read about any other births. Probably because His birth is so important, every other birth is not even worth mentioning. <clears throat> Let me give you three thoughts this morning. God sent forth His Son, first of all, God sent forth His Son to bring God to man. To bring God to man. I want to remind you that when Jesus was born in Bethlehem, He didn't begin being God then. He's always been God. God came down to man because man could not go to where God was. The Bible says in the book of John that God became flesh and dwelt among us. The Bible tells us that the God of heaven came to earth in the form of a baby and He was at the same time 100% God and 100% man all at the same time. God sent forth His Son to bring God to man. Number one, Jesus brought God's love to man. John 3.16, you know John 3.16. I preached a whole sermon about it the other week. The Bible says, For God so loved the world that He gave us His only begotten Son that whosoever believed in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God showed His love towards us in Romans 5, 8. God commended His love toward us, and that while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. He sent forth His Son as a token of His love for mankind. John 3, 16, you'll see it everywhere. Anybody watch a football game today, you'll probably see it somewhere in the crowd. Somebody hold up a sign, a big yellow fluorescent yellow sign. John 3, 16, that person may not even go to church. I saw a documentary the other day about, uh, about a certain prison, and one of the new trends uh, in prison is to get certain tattoos, which means certain things. Uh, and uh, it was interesting how all, a lot of these hardened murderers and rapists and drug dealers and all of these, they would have on their body somewhere tattooed John 3.16. God sent forth His... Son, to bring love to mankind. Without Jesus Christ, we couldn't love. Without God, there'd be no love because the Bible tells us God is love. God gave us Himself as a gift for sinful mankind. It was not wrapped 
with wrapping paper and put up under a tree. It was wrapped in swaddling clothes and lied in a manger for me and for you. And there was no tag on there uh, from God to such and such. It was from God to the world. God sent forth His Son uh, and to bring love to mankind. Also, number two, Jesus brought God's light to man. Listen to John chapter 8, verse 12. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Very interesting. That Jesus came to a, a dark and sinful world. Really, in the year 000, it was dark and sinful? Oh, yeah, it was. It was dark politically. I mean, the king wanted to kill Jesus. I'd say that's dark politically. Uh, it was dark financially. The tax collectors in, in, his, in, in this day would charge whatever they needed to make their ends meet that week. It was dark financially. It was dark morally. There was all kind of terrible moral things and moral things happening. Read Romans chapter 1. You read about some pretty terrible things happening morally during this time. It was even dark spiritually. But then came the light. And Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Jesus didn't say, I will be, or I might be, or I shall be. No, he says this, I am the light of the world. And how the light come down, and God didn't turn on some spotlight and shine a spotlight on mankind. No, listen, church, he came forth to bring life, to bring light to all of us through his son, Jesus Christ. He's the light of the world. And can I say, things are still dark in our world. It's dark politically don't believe me, don't watch the news. It's dark financially. It's dark socially. Even the Hallmark Channel is encouraging gay marriage. <clears throat> Educational system, dark. But Jesus is still the light of the world. Take him out of the schools. That'll help. That didn't help. Take him out of the courthouse, that'll help. No, if you remove the light, all that we have left is darkness. Tonight when you go to bed, when you, for the last time, turn your little, uh, by your bed, the little lamp, turn off, what happens? Your room gets dark because you've taken away the light. If we remove the Lord, we're removing the light of the world. And Jesus, the Bible says, God for, sent forth his Son to bring God's light to man. Number three, Jesus brought God's life. Man, <clears throat> listen to 1 John 5, 11 and 12. What a great passage. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life. And this life is in His Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Life. The only way you and I can have any life whatsoever is because of Jesus Christ and God sent forth His Son to bring God to man, to bring God's love to man, to bring God's light to man, to bring God's life to man. You and I can only have eternal life by putting our faith and trust in the eternal Son of God. His name is Jesus. <clears throat> you see, God knew we'd all be sinners. <laughs> he knew our sin would require sacrifice. The Old Testament sacrifices didn't quite get the job done. But those Old Testament sacrifices pointed to the New Testament sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. <clears throat> Number two, write this down. God sent forth His Son to bring glory to man. I looked up the word glory and found all kind of definitions. I want to share a few of them with you this morning. The word glory means brightness, luster, Splendor. The word glory means magnificence. It means praise ascribed in adoration. It means honor. It means praise. It means the divine presence of God. And as I look through all these definitions, I see one word. I see the word Jesus because He's brightness. He's luster. He's splendor. He's magnificent. He's to be praised. He's to be adored. And He's to be honored. In Jesus Christ, we have the divine presence of God. 
God sent forth His Son to bring glory to man. First of all, Jesus brought the glory of fellowship to man. 1 John 1, 3 says, that, uh, that which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us, and listen carefully, please. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. Last night at church we had a fellowship. We had our Christmas party. We had fellowship. We got together, you and I, as a family of believers, and we got together, we ate barbecue, we had a spelling bee, we played Name That Tune, and we heard a good message, we sang a bunch of songs, and we talked, and we laughed together. We had fellowship together. And without God, that can still happen. But we cannot have fellowship with God the Father without His Son coming forth. We can know God the Father because of His Son. Listen, we can talk to God the Father because of His Son. We can listen when God speaks because of His Son. We can be right with the Lord because of His Son. Jesus brought the glory of fellowship to man. Number two, Jesus brought the glory of sonship to man. 1 John 3, 1 says, Behold, such a good verse. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. If you're saved and you're a male, I hope you're not confused what you are. If you're saved and you're a male, you're a son of God. <clears throat> If you're saved and you're a female, you're a daughter of God. How is that possible? Because God sent forth His Son that we can be called the, the Son of God. Whatever your title is, I happen to be pastor, whoop de doo More importantly, I'm a Son of God. I think I told you one time about a couple of guys I played football with in junior high. One's name was Channing Flynn. Just that name, Channing Flynn, just kind of makes you know he's a snooty person. You know what snooty means, don't you? Snooty? Okay, good. You know, that's just a southern word. Snooty. Channing Flynn's dad was a superintendent of schools for New Hanover County, North Carolina, when I was in eighth grade. And he made sure that everybody on the football team, on the baseball team, on the basketball team, the principal, all of our teachers, they all knew Channing's dad was the superintendent of schools. And boy, he rubbed it in. He took advantage of that. Come time when our grades came out, if Channing's grades were kind of, I don't know, borderline, well, he got the benefit of the doubt. When it comes time to run sprints, Channing's, it seemed like his hamstrings always hurt him, so he got to sit over there and watch us run till we threw up. And he wasn't a very good ball player, but isn't it not interesting that Channing Flynn was always in the starting lineup? He got special privileges because his father was the superintendent of schools. Another friend of mine named Mike Childress. Mike Childress's dad owned the biggest company in Wilmington, North Carolina in about 1986 or 7 or so. Forget what it was. But he was the richest kid in town and in school. And again, everybody knew that Mike Childress's father was Mr. Childress, the richest man in town. And again, come time to run sprints. Oh, coach, my, my hand, oh, my knee, my, I can't, I can't. Okay, Mike, you just hang out over there because we know your dad's going to write us a big check to our booster club. <clears throat> There was a drill in football called the Oklahoma drill. It's where, it's where you, you, lay down, uh, you lay down on your back and one guy's got a football and the other guy doesn't have a football and the, and the coach blows the whistle and when that whistle blows, you two get up and the guy with the football is trying to get through this guy and the guy with the football is trying to get through. You're trying, there's a lot of contact made. And any time that Mike Childress was in that Oklahoma drill, we wanted to be next. I want to go against Mike Childress because that's the only time we could inflict harm upon him and do it legally. <clears throat> he got special rights and privileges because of who his father was. Are you listening? You and I, as a child of God, no matter who our earthly daddy is, our father 
is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And our Father owns the cattle on a thousand hills. And our Father both owns and controls everything in the universe. And I'd like to go back to Channing and, and Mike and say something like this. I, I, remember how we were all jealous about who your father was? Well, I got news for you there, Channing and, and Mike. Uh, uh, my father can whoop your father. <laughs> and, and, if you, and if your father wants to go to heaven, then your father must talk to my father because my father is God. Put that in your pipe and smoke it, Channing Flynn. <laughs> Jesus brought the glory of Sonship to man. You and I get to be a child of God because of Jesus. Because God sent forth His Son to bring glory to man through fellowship, through sonship. Number three, the glory of worship to man. Go back in your mind to Matthew chapter 2. The Bible says that the wise men, when they saw the star in the east, you see, they were in the east. The star wasn't in the east. The star was over Bethlehem. The wise men were in the east. And when they saw the star, since they were wise men, they knew what that meant. This special star, that star meant as they studied through the Old Testament and as probably Daniel the prophet would teach them and, and, and talk to, to their fathers and their forefathers and, and he, would, he would train them and they would say, okay, here's the star. That star means something. That star means that the Savior is born. So they saw the star and they left from the east when they saw the star when Christ was born. And here's about two years later in Matthew 2, they get to where they thought the child was, they get to Jerusalem and they say, where is he that's born king of the Jews? We've seen his star in the east. We've come to worship him. And they say, well, he's not here. He's that, that king's born in Bethlehem. So they go to Bethlehem and they find now Jesus, he's a young child. So now it's about two years has taken place from they leave from the east to go find the baby Jesus. A two years journey. And now traveling in the year Ought, ought, B.C. was way different than it is now. There's no Uber, Brother Steve. There's no Airbnb. There's no, I mean, when you, you traveled all day, that night you set up your camp. The next day you picked up your tent and you traveled a few more miles. And so about a two-year process from when Christ was born in Bethlehem till Luke chapter, or Matthew 2, 11, when they get to where the, they, they see the, uh, the, the young child, the Bible says that they open their treasure and present to him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. Why would they do this? It's just a baby. No, the innkeeper thought it was just a baby. But these wise men knew it was the king of kings and the Lord of Lords, they knew it was their Savior. So after this two years journey, their first thought wasn't checking in the motel. Their first thought wasn't unloading the luggage. Their first thought wasn't having a nap. Their first thought wasn't getting something to eat. Their first thought wasn't relaxing and setting up their motel. Their first thought was this, we're going to go and worship. So they bring the Lord their gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Why? Because God sent forth His Son to bring the glory of worship to you and I. The songs we've sung this morning, that was all worship. We ought to sing these songs of worship just like that as a, as a type of worship to the Lord. As a type of telling the Lord how thankful you are for what He's done for you, singing these songs of worship to God. When you gave your offering, that was a type of worship to the Lord. You're telling the Lord, thank you so much for my income. I want to give you back 10% of what is yours already. That's a kind of worship as you pray together, as you hear me preach in a moment, as you respond to the Word of God. It's all worshiping our Lord and Savior because God sent forth His Son to bring us the glory even of worship. <clears throat> Number three, and we'll be done. God sent forth His Son to bring grace to man. 
John chapter 1 verse 16 says, And of His fullness have we all received, and grace for grace. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. You see, without Jesus, there'd be no grace. The only way we can have the grace of God is because of the Son of God. Under the law, under the law, we're, we're bound. Under the law, we're, we're, we're slaves. Under the law, uh, the, the, the Jews were, were, were held captive, so to speak, by, in their mind, keeping a certain list of rules. And listen, that's not freedom. That's not salvation. That's not being right with the Lord. That's just being right with mankind. But when Jesus came, the Bible told us in the verse I just read uh, that, that, that grace, uh, that the law came by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Uh, serving, uh, Jesus brought serving grace to man. The only way we can serve the Lord is because of the grace of God. We don't have the ability to faithfully serve God on our own. A lot of things happened in the last few weeks to make last night's little fellowship, you know, happen. A lot of people have, have served yesterday. A lot of folks had to run around and get things and prepare things and cook things and set up things and decorate and all of that. A lot of things, a lot of things took place to, to make last night possible. A lot of folks had to serve uh, to make all that happen. And the only way we have strength to do all of that is because of the grace that comes from God because God sent forth His Son to, to bring serving grace to mankind. But more importantly than serving grace, number two is Jesus brought sufficient grace to man. You know this verse, 2 Corinthians 12, 9. And he said unto me, My grace, here's, here's Paul talking now. Jesus tells Paul, My grace, Paul, my grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, Paul says, will I glory in my infirmities that, he, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Paul was confident now from the prison cell, from all he went through, Paul was confident that the grace he needs to sustain his life would only be sufficient if it comes from the Lord. And lo and behold, that's where it came from. It came from Jesus Christ. When we're weak, the Lord's grace is still sufficient for us. When we're lonely, the Lord's grace is sufficient for us. When we don't have what it takes, His grace is sufficient for us. When we're without, His grace is sufficient. When we don't know what to do, when we don't know how we're going to make it, when we're at our wit's end, uh, when we are, had, are down to our last nerve and somebody is stomping on that nerve wearing golf cleats, His grace is still sufficient for us. And it's only found in Jesus Christ. Number three, and finally, Jesus brought saving grace to man. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, some of the best scripture in all the Bible, says this. Listen carefully, and we're done. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is what? The gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. The only way you and I could ever have the hope to be saved is because of the grace of God. And where does that grace come from? It does not come from getting baptized. It does not come from joining our church. It doesn't come from putting money in the plate. It doesn't come from taking, making a bunch of do's and don'ts. It doesn't come from dressing a certain way or talking a certain way or acting a certain way. The grace of God only comes from His Son, Jesus Christ. And God sent forth His Son and it brought saving grace to man. Let me close this morning. I want to read Titus chapter 2. A few verses there. You know the verses. Titus chapter 2, verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, 
Jesus Christ who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify us unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. Back in verse number uh, 13, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. That's talking about the grace of God has appeared unto all men. In other words, it's available to all men. You don't have to be of a certain culture type to receive the grace of God. It's appeared to all men. You don't have to have a certain skin color or come from a certain country or speak a certain language. No, you can receive the grace of God because it's been shown it's available uh, to all men. How is that even possible? All men? Yes, all men. Because God sent forth his son, to bring God to man, to bring glory to man, and to bring grace to man. Would you stand to your feet this morning, please? Every head's bowed, every eye's closed for, for just a moment, please.